I'm Carl King, and this is the Carl King Podcast, where every week we learn about music, filmmaking, and the other creative arts. To support this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash Carl King and join for just $1 or $5 per month. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist $51 level patrons, both Hank Howard III and Chubode. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennium Media. Now, let's get this episode beginned. Just a few Carl King the Human updates, and then we will officially get beginned. Number one, I'm in the process of mapping out all of my own creative work for 2023. Inside my Patreon, I recently posted a list of everything I want to release this year, and that includes a couple of new musical albums and some re-releases of a book and a film. This weekend, I put it all into a spreadsheet with a breakdown of every week of the year and realized, uh uh-oh. This is too many things. So now I am rethinking my strategy. But either way, expect more focus on music this year. Number two, I just released an updated Patreon trailer. And you can see that on my YouTube or on my actual Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Number three, have you ever wanted to wear a Sir Millard Mulch shirt? Well, I just made available a whole bunch of new merch on TeePublic. I've got old Sir Millard Mulch and Dr. Zoltan designs that were never printed, as well as some new designs for that monster show. There's t-shirts, long sleeves, hoodies, coffee mugs, stickers, and most importantly, pillows, if you want to take a nap on Sir Millard Mulch. So head over to tpublic slash user slash Carl Kingdom or click on the link in the show notes. And number four, someone named Hansel Gonzalez posted a message on Facebook asking how to play what I am calling the bass interlude chord during Mr. Bungle's Travolta. So I made a short YouTube video demonstrating what I think it is, including tab and notation and I will post a link to that in the show notes. Number five, remember my previous episode where I analyzed Red Dress by Sarah Brand? Well, she left me a nice comment on my YouTube video, and it simply says, thanks for the thoughtful analysis, and a little winky smiley face. And now, let's get into this week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week. This week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week is Tar, directed by and screenwriting by Todd Field and starring Kate Blanchett from Thor Ragnarok. Let's start with the music. I went into this only hoping that the music would be as good as it was in the trailer. I was led by my own imagination to believe that this was a film about a noisy orchestral composer. Unfortunately, that piece of music is only used briefly in a single scene. It's by a composer whose name I can't properly pronounce, but her first name is Anna, and the last name is spelled T-H-O-R-V-A-L-D-S-D-O-T-T-I-R. So I think that's Thorvaldsdottir? Thorvaldsdottir? I'm sorry. The piece of music is called Row. And as far as I know, there's no relation to Chris Higgins. And it has those prepared piano bangs and creepy string and woodwind sounds. It's a really cool piece of music in my own subjective opinion. And I will put a link to it in the show notes. 
Now, Tar is a film loaded with classical music and music theory jargon. So I was kind of proud of myself for understanding it. I believe the players in the orchestra were legit classical musicians instead of actors. And I think only Tar's partner, the concertmaster, was acting. And aside from her vibrato, it was mostly believable. There are some performance shots where her bowing is pretty darn good. So we've come a long way since Ralph Macchio faked his guitar playing in the film Crossroads. Let's talk about the structure and ri- What the f Ah, f***ing Tom Cruise landing his helicopter on my building again. Now, let's talk about the structure and rhythm. The film begins with a candid 30-second shot, and it's Lydia Tarr sleeping on a plane. And there's no context for a scene like this. So this film is going to require us to do some work. And that is followed by four minutes of intro credits. There's a tiny typeface, white over black, and it's mostly the crew rather than the cast. I don't know who has ever put the entire VFX crew credits up front in a movie. I had the thought, is this whole movie going to be backwards? Well, the first actual scene is a roughly 11 minute interview with a New Yorker writer. And that's unusual, isn't it? So much for all those rules they teach in screenwriting classes. The theme here is addiction to status and addiction to power. So rather than a rise to success and fame, this film follows Lydia Tarr's slow descent into destruction. Let's talk about the character and acting. It's revealed that Lydia Tarr is not her real name. She has actually altered her real name and even added a pretentious accent over the A to appear more exotic. Her character is obsessed with and imitates composer Leonard Bernstein, going so far as to sit alone at home and imitate one of his album covers in the mirror, and even having one of his exact shirts remade so she can wear it exactly as he did. She's literally trying to become him. And that makes me wonder if Lydia is a reference to the Lydian mode famously used in Bernstein's West Side Story. She constantly drops cultural and literary references to peacock her status and sophistication. And it is exhausting and reminds me of some people I've met. I was amused by her bizarre mannerisms when she's trying to center or reset herself. Like when lighting candles, she does a little ritual, this whispering sound. And when composing at the piano, there's this brush off the shoulders and waving her fingers in front of her nose behavior that she also did just before going on stage with the New Yorker interview. I'm assuming that these are behaviors stolen directly from Bernstein. And you might notice whenever she doesn't like someone, she calls them a robot. Now, why is that? And this comes up again and again. And I wonder what the creative source of this was. We don't know yet. But probably my favorite acting of this film was by Nina Haas, who plays Lydia Tarr's wife. Her silent reacting to interactions between Lydia and the young cellist. It shows she knows exactly what's going on between the two of them. Now let's talk about the cinematography. That scene at Juilliard with the bouncy leg pan gender student is a single long take. I think they used Steadicam because part of the way through, it's likely the operator went down those stairs at the front of the stage. And that scene is 10 and a half minutes of flawless execution. And during that, Tar so obviously thinks she's Bernstein. If you've ever seen his lecture series, 
Tar talks exactly like him, and it comes off as unbelievably pretentious. Now let's talk about some of the storytelling choices that were made. There is a story of a scandalous affair and a suicide going on in the background. Now in any other film, that main action of the story would have been followed as it was happening in the now, but we never actually witness it because the camera wasn't there. We never even meet the girl that Tar destroyed. We only see vague, abstract, dreamlike flashbacks. So we don't see Krista Taylor's face, only her hair. And it's a clever way to go about it because it mirrors Lydia Tar's efforts to block the girl out of her consciousness. So as the viewers, we experience it from the perspective of someone repressing memories. So the narrator is in denial. And there are other mysterious bits of information we have to put together ourselves, as they are never overtly stated with dialogue. First of all, Tar is stealing and abusing her wife's beta blockers for the purpose of lowering her adrenaline. And I didn't put that together until a repeat viewing. Second, it's never explained, but I think that Lydia's wife must have stolen the performance score of Mahler's fifth. So her wife was already making moves to remove Tar from her life. Third, why did we need that scene with the neighbor? Well, maybe because it shows how uncomfortable Tar is with humanity, suffering, old age, and even death. Was this related to her past? Did something similar happen to one of her parents? Maybe her dad? And fourth, during that scene where she tosses all of her Mahler vinyls onto the floor, who was in the room with her? We only see feet. Well, I'm assuming it was one of her affairs. Maybe even Krista Taylor. These mysteries are set up in the same way that Obi-Wan Kenobi briefly mentions something called the Clone Wars in A New Hope but then never explains it. And many argue it should have been left that way. So the filmmakers here have created a complex character in Lydia Tarr. They show us barely enough, and as viewers, we want to know more. Overall, this story seems to be abstractly based on the life of Leonard Bernstein himself, but without the sudden scandal and crumbling career. Now, regarding the budget and production, according to Wikipedia, Tar had a $30 million budget and only a $7 million box office. That means that it made maybe one-fourth of its budget back. However, I loved this film, and Mark Borchart also told me it was the most meaningful film for him in 2022. So I give Tar five out of five stars and a little heart on Letterboxd. And now, let's move on to this week's Analytical Music Analysis of the Week. This week's Analytical Musical Analysis of the Week is Steve Vai's Greasy Kid Stuff from his 1991 album, Passion and Warfare. Coincidentally or not coincidentally, my favorite album of all time. Little bit of trivia, I discovered there are many songs called Greasy Kid Stuff. Even They Might Be Giants wrote one. And from what I can tell, it's a reference to a hair product, possibly generic, used in the 1950s. Now I'm guessing it's related to the term greaser. And I will put some links to some YouTube videos including old commercials mentioning Greasy Kid Stuff, in the show notes. Now today, I'm going to focus on only the outro of this song, because Steve uses a compositional technique known as planing. And I think it's fascinating, yet simple. But before I explain what planing is, let's talk a little bit of basic music theory. In a major key, like C major, you have seven notes, C, D, 
E, F, G, A, and B. And for each note, there is a simple triad or three note chord built on it. Now, how do we do that? To build a triad on C, you play C and then skip the letter D and play E. Skip the next letter F and play G. So you have C, E, and G. And that is a C major triad. If you do this with each of the seven notes, it will sound like this. C, D, E, F, G, A, and B. That's seven triads, one built on each note of the scale. Now, without getting into too much detail, we end up with three major triads and three minor triads. There's also one diminished triad built on the seventh note. And compared to the other triads, it is rarely used. So to review, in a key, we have seven notes and seven triads or chords. And when we stick to using just those notes and triads, the music is called diatonic. But what would happen if we make all of those triads major? Well, that would no longer be diatonic, and it would sound like this. C major, D major, E major, F major, G major, A major, and B major. Now for extra credit, you can try making them all minor and see how that sounds. But anyway, if we make all of these chords major, even though our root notes, or the notes that these chords are based on, are in C major, the rest of the notes in the chord can be outside of C major. In other words, we would have to use a bunch of sharps and flats, or black keys. For instance, the D major chord is D, F sharp, and A. And E major is E, G sharp, and B. And skipping a bunch of them, the B major would have two sharps. B, D sharp, and F sharp. Now, when we start breaking out of diatom... Hang on, another helicopter. I don't understand how many f***ing helicopters. Oh man. This is so loud. Okay. Now when we start breaking out of diatonic, in this case, the sound becomes chromatic. And that would mean using all 12 of the notes instead of just seven. Now, when we go up or down in pitch with all the same chord shape, such as all major or all minor, all of the voices are moving in parallel motion. So on a guitar, you would see it's all the same chord shape moving up and down the neck. And that is called planing, also called parallel harmony. Now getting back to the outro of Greasy Kid Stuff, this is exactly what Mr. Vi is doing. This outro is played sort of in the key of A with three sharps. And those would be the notes A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, and then A again. But we find out quickly it's not just in the key of A, it's only in relation to the key of A, because the rhythm section is holding down an A note, and Steve is moving parallel major chords, or planing, over the top of it. He's using layers of guitar harmonies to create tension and release, or maybe just tension. 
we don't know yet. So let's dig into the analysis of the outro of Greasy Kid Stuff. He starts with an F major chord over that A. And by the way, this is that classic outer space mediant chord relationship that people like Devin Townsend use all the time. And then Steve goes up chromatically from F major to F sharp major to G major. And we can hear where he might be going next. He works his way from G major to G sharp major and lands on A major. Notice that at this point, the guitar harmonies and the bass note are now both playing A major. They're back to their home bass. And Steve reinforces that A major sound by playing a little fill with the notes E, F sharp, and G sharp. And those would be the scale degrees five, six, and seven. So they are sort of jazzy notes to emphasize, but that's okay. And for the next phrase, it gets very tense. And he goes into outer space because he uses these major chords. C sharp, B flat, B, G sharp, A, and B flat. Now notice the sequence there in those first four notes of that phrase. It's three half steps down, one half step up, three more half steps down, and one more half step up. And that is the basic pattern of the diminished or octatonic scale. And then he goes up to A and B flat. The next phrase continuing on that B flat goes B flat, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and E. And those are all chromatic half steps going up. It is getting extremely chromatic and tense at this point, but you can still hear that A is hammering away down there in the rhythm section. For the next phrase, he uses these major chords moving downward. F, D, E flat, C, C sharp, B flat, B, G sharp, and F. And there's that same sequence again with three half steps down, one half step up. Similar to the diminished or octatonic scale, but in a different location. And then he moves back up, starting on F, to F sharp, to G, G sharp, A, and B flat. And that sequence here is again, all chromatic half steps. And finally landing on B over A, which is a Lydian sound. And the song ends. So it never actually resolves to A over A. It just kind of hangs there. And that's okay. It creates forward motion and makes us listen for what's going to happen next. By the way, in this outro, Steve has used every note of the chromatic scale. Now, planing, or parallel harmony, is not an uncommon compositional technique in classical music. It's all over the music of Stravinsky and Ravel and even John Williams. It's a way to add more tension and break outside of simple diatonic harmony. So be sure to check out Steve Vai's Passion and Warfare album for more of his creative uses of reharmonization and guitar orchestration. Okay, that's the end of this episode of the Carl King Podcast. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or anywhere else you listen to these dang podcasts. And support the creation of more episodes by joining my Patreon for just $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash carlking. 
or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. And as always, special thanks to my $51 a month patrons at the special illusionist level, Chubode and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for listening. And as I always say, okay then, I will let everyone know. <laughs> <laughs>